Hello, everyone. Welcome again to another episode of Living History. Great to have you here. And uh, thank you again, like always, for the feedback you've been giving us through Facebook and Twitter about the recent episodes. If you haven't uh, reached out to us on those social media platforms, please do, because it's always great to hear from you and hear your thoughts about the history that we're putting out. Uh, Speaking of interesting chapters of history, this month marks the 60th anniversary, if you can believe that, of the deployment of the first group of Australian troops to Vietnam uh, in the Vietnam War. It was the Australian Army Training Team Vietnam, uh, otherwise known as The Team, um, a really fascinating chapter of, the, of Australia's Vietnam War story, which probably doesn't get as much uh, coverage as it deserves to. We're going to hopefully remedy that today. We're joined by someone who's been on the podcast quite a few times. You'd know him well through his books. You'd know him through the tours he leads for us to Vietnam. It's uh, it's my good friend, Gary Mackay. Gary, thanks for joining us on Living History. Good day, Matt. How are you? Mate, I'm really great. I mean, we were just saying before we started recording, 60 years. It's It's... It's remarkable. It seems to me only yesterday that I was—I felt like you know the Second World War was only you know we were doing the fortieth anniversaries of the Second World War. Time is certainly marching on. Does it feel to you uh, like it's been half a century since these things occurred in Vietnam? Yep. <laughs> my my body tells me every day when I finish going to exercise classes that I. Yeah, but it's funny. Uh, well, when, when you've been there and done it it the memories are just always so fresh and you know I think back I was I was looking back through uh, the book that I wrote on the training team with a very good friend of mine the late Bruce Davies who did three tours of duty in Vietnam and I was looking through the photos of the guys that are in the book and to my chagrin I guess a lot of them have passed on because a lot of those training team guys who deployed were senior soldiers when they went. They weren't young diggers like went with the infantry battalions in 1965. Yeah, I think that's an interesting thing. We're going to talk about the training team in detail and you'll give us a good overview of what they actually did. But the first thing to say is that they were the you know, the very first troops to deploy to Vietnam. That was the, the, the first echelon to go over there. And you were really in the last group, weren't you, to fight? So you were at opposite bookends of the war. Um, what effect did that have on you? I mean, did you know of the experiences of the training team and did you did you look up to them as the sort of experienced older soldiers? Oh, absolutely. Uh, when, um, when I went to the Jungle Training Centre at Canungra um, to do my battle efficiency course in 1970 before deploying the next year, um, there's a a large memorial there to the training team guys uh, because they treated Canungra as their sort of army base in Australia. And it's where their first commanding officer, Ted Sarong, he'd actually been an instructor at Canungra. And uh, because they were a training team, it was appropriate they also had a training establishment as their sort of home base, if you like. But we were very much aware of it. Um, A lot of my instructors when I went through the officer training unit at Skyville were ex-training team members. And and you listen to those guys because where the training team was deployed in South Vietnam was where the heavy lifting was done. And uh, it's where, you know, fighting was at its most savage. We'll get on specifically to the training team and the good work that they did uh, in a moment. But just from your perspective as an infantryman, as a young soldier um, joining the army and, and deploying for the first time, I, I, I know we've discussed this before in interviews about your experience that the men who trained you were, some of them were World War II veterans, some of them had fought in Malaya uh, and other conflicts, Korea, and then had done earlier tours uh, in Vietnam. How important was that lineage of experience as it came down through your initial training? Uh, well, I was going to say vital, but it's also it was also essential because there's so much stuff in books you just can't get. And it's until you're out in the field training with one of these guys hovering around behind you and kicking you up the backside to tell you to get into a better fire position or to do this and to do that that you realise that, hey, this guy's alive because he did it the right way. 
and yet he'd been in so many battles or contacts and firefights. So you you tended to listen to what these guys had to say. Well, I suppose they they uh, they lived the experience, hadn't they? They'd seen where how making a mistake on the on the field of battle can go fatally wrong. And uh, as you say, that's not something you can learn in books. And and I think even with training, when I've spoken to people who've been in combat, the uh, the development of the fighting skills that actually take place on the battlefield, even compared to the training, is is the difference between keeping you alive and 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 sending you home. So um, it must have been uh, extraordinary to have access to these uh, experienced combat men. It was. It was. It was fantastic. Just to give you an idea of the difference in experience, my co-author, Bruce Davies, uh, on his third tour of duty, he was with a mic force, which is a mobile strike force. And they were in I-Corps, which is right up near the DMZ, and they were running, it was almost conventional operations. And it wasn't like counter-guerrilla warfare like we were having down in Fuktui province in Three Corps, Bruce's unit would have as many casualties on a two-week operation as our infantry battalions were taking in a whole year. That was the difference. So when these guys talked about contact, (laughs) they were talking on a different plane, a different level, and so you you listened to what they had to say because they'd been there and done it. Well, let's talk about the training team and specifically what they did because we're right at the start of, well, not the start of the war because everyone who knows the experience of the Vietnam War knows that it went on for effectively decades before we got involved. But at the start of what we would consider that chapter of the war when we were deploying over there, um, and they were, as the name suggested, the Australian Army training team back in an era when we thought we wouldn't actually have to contribute that much to make a material difference in Vietnam <laughs> and That's how right. wrong that was quickly proven. Um, but just tell us a little bit about the AATTV and, and and what they did in 1962. Well, there were 30 men in that first gaggle and uh, when they deployed, they were spread into five different locations in small groups. Now, you've got to remember that these blokes were, they were, they were led by a colonel, but they had a couple of majors, a handful of captains, and the bulk of them were warrant officers. And if they weren't warrant officers, they were senior sergeants who may have even been wearing the rank of temporary warrant officer or acting warrant officer just to give them some prestige and clout when they got deployed. And they were deployed to training organisations up in the north of the country, from Da Nang north, and... For the first 12 months, probably not even that long, all they did was advise on training. They didn't go outside the wire. This is to the South Vietnamese troops, isn't it? Yes, yeah, absolutely. And to the Arvin, the Army of the Republic of Vietnam. And they are all regulars, conscripts, but they were still regular soldiers. They weren't militia from the local village. So they were there to train these men in war fighting. And uh, it was like that for about nine months. Quite frustrating because guys were in helicopters flying over battles knowing that if they were put down on the ground, they could have made a difference. Um, But Australia was very reluctant. The government was very reluctant to commit people into combat. Um, they were selling the we're trainers, we're trainers, not fighters. And uh, but it didn't take long for that to change, and they started to deploy outside the wire in 1963. Well, it's one of the things that always strikes me when you talk about the training team is that the name is really a bit boring. It suggests, you know, studious application and lots of reading of books and looking at charts and things like that. But in reality, they became one of the most, um, you know, one of the most highly decorated, one of the one of the one of the most important aspects of Australia's entire contribution to Vietnam. So just t- just tell us a little bit about how that role evolved and what they ended up doing uh, later on in Vietnam. Well, when they were allowed to deploy, they attached them to to formations and to large units like battalions, and so you might have 
a major in a woe one working on a, a, a brigade headquarters or a task force headquarters, and then you'd have a captain in a woe advising a battalion commander. And then, and until the training team grew to a couple of hundred, uh, that's what they basically did. So they advised on strategy and tactics in the field to that level. And then when they started to get into heavy combat, some of those advisors ended up commanding those Vietnamese units because the, the commanders had been killed or wounded or taken out of action. And we realised very quickly, well, the Americans and the Vietnamese realised very quickly that what Australia had to offer was priceless. And so they asked for more and more people. And, of course, that all happened between 64 and 65 when they were making the decision to deploy combat troops to Vietnam, uh, like the 1st Battalion, who joined the Americans in Benoit in 1965. And so then we find, in from 64 onwards, that the guys are actually not so much training team advisors, they're, they are simply advisors, they're combat advisors in the field. And it, they were in some heavy battles. Uh, and as a matter of, you know, four Victoria Crosses and another hundred other high decorations uh, amongst a thousand men is a pretty good indicator that they're in some heavy stuff. Well, tell us about some of those battles, Gary, because reading about the exploits of the team in Vietnam, it's just extraordinary. And as you said, quite different in many ways from the combat that you would experience in the sort of the cloying jungles of Phuc Thuy later in the war. Uh, tell us about some of the big battles the, the team were involved in, particularly in the earlier days of the war. Uh, some of them were horrendous. Uh, on a couple of occasions, uh, guys were out there with Arvin battalions and they would be outnumbered by the North Vietnamese or the Viet Cong main force. And we, when I say outnumbered, I'm talking of more than three or four to one where the chances of getting out were slim. And that's where a couple of our Victoria Crosses came from, where guys like Dasher Wheatley uh, having his company overrun, uh, going backwards and forwards time after time to drag people out. Um, Keith Payne was another one who literally their unit was being, and in the true sense of the word, decimated. And some of those battles are mainly up in I Corps. And uh, and often um, put into areas where they knew there was going to be heavy contact to try and disrupt the movement of the North Vietnamese into that area, so that it, to stop them from cutting off the units along the DMZ. So um, some of these battles raged for days. Um, you know, our longest battle down in the southern part of the country um, with one and three RAR at Coral and Balmoral. That lasted a month, but it wasn't a month of intense. It was intense for a couple of days and then it just went on and on and on with contacts and firefights every day for a month. These battles up north were intense. And if you uh, – time for an advertisement here. If you, if you go to my book – uh, there's some great photos there of some fire support bases that were being protected by guys from uh, the Arvin with AATDV advisors, and you would not uh, you would not imagine the amount of artillery shells that they fired in their own defence. We're talking thousands upon thousands of 105 millimetre artillery rounds just to keep the enemy at bay. Um, when you read about battles like Khaesan, imagine that on a smaller scale, but happening a lot more often. That's how intense it was. 
Just extraordinary and, and quite different from what we think about as, as the Australian experience in Vietnam. You mentioned the book, Gary. Let's give it a proper plug. Uh, what's what's the book called? It's, this is your book about the Australian, uh, about the training team. What's it called? Yeah, it's called The Men Who Persevered. And we, we got that from the AATDV cap badge, uh, which they wear on their caps or berets. And their motto is persevere. And these were the guys um, that went in and they tended to do their tour of duty in two parts. They'd do six months out in the field where all the heavy lifting was being done. And then around about the six month mark, they put them into a quieter, <laughs> if, there, if there was such a thing up in the north of the country, into a quieter area where it wasn't as intense as the first six months. It was so they didn't burn them out. Um, you know, you, you heard me talk about the number of casualties. Well, we were also taking uh, casualties as well. And um, we were pretty lucky that we only lost, you know, the 30 or 40 guys uh, that we did um, out of the training team. But... Um, The, the type of warfare, as I said, was almost conventional warfare. Um, Bruce Davies told me a story when uh, we were writing the book when he was sent out in the, on, during his second tour out towards the border onto the Ho Chi Minh Trail. And they came across this guy standing at a road intersection with a clue board marking off trucks that were coming down the road. And it wasn't until they got closer, they realised this guy was North Vietnamese and he was doing road traffic control. That's that's the difference. And they were bringing down not just trucks, but they were bringing down artillery, light, light tanks, rocket launchers, you name it, and it was just totally different. It strikes me, Gary, that the training team, having been there since the earliest days of Australia's involvement and working so closely with the South Vietnamese, they must have felt when you know when it all went so hor horribly wrong at the end of the war and the fall of Saigon and everything we know about the end of the Vietnam War. Those guys must have felt that pretty keenly, having worked so closely with the the South Vietnamese troops. Is, is that a fair thing to say? Absolutely. When when we were doing interviews for the book, the one word that kept on coming up time after time after time when we talked about the withdrawal of Australian forces from Vietnam, the word was betrayal. I mean, these guys lived and fought and died with a lot of these Vietnamese soldiers. And some of those Vietnamese men had been at war constantly for 10 years. They didn't have a one-year tour of duty and then go back home. They stayed there and fought there. And you can imagine, when we left, these guys from Australia who'd grown very attached to these blokes because they were brothers in arms. They felt betrayal and, uh, and, and in some cases disgust at the, at the decision to pull out the way they did. But to be honest, we had no option. You mentioned some of those um, key characters in the, uh, the, in the training team, uh, Dasha Wheatley and um, Keith Payne. Tell us a little bit more about those and the, and, the, and the VC winners, you know, in the training team because, again, um, quite a distinct type of fighting in which they earned those awards compared to uh, the, the, the generally perceived Australian experience. So can you give us a, just a little bit of background about, uh, about the great achievements that these men did to earn the VC? Oh, look, uh, blokes like Ray Simpson, um, he uh, had fought in Korea as well and... Um, he wouldn't have passed the medical in Australia. He wanted to go and join the training team, right? So, so he enlisted in Japan to short circuit the system, right? And so he went from Japan to Vietnam, and uh, and and then became a legend in his own lunchtime, you know, because of of his actions. One of my uh, one of my favourite characters, and I actually worked with him at Canungra, 
when I uh, when I returned to active duty after my tour of duty in Vietnam, I was posted to the Jungle Training Center, and uh, I was on Battle Wing. And on Battle Wing, there was collective training and individual training wing. And for the second part of my first year there, I was sent to individual training wing. And there was a captain there, and um, his name was Len Opie. He's since passed, but Len had a distinguished conduct medal from unbelievable achievements in Korea during the fighting there. <laughs> and uh, when I marched in, um, I didn't really know a lot about Len Opie. It turns out he was a militia soldier, right, from the Second World War who then went to Korea and then he went to Vietnam. Now, he spent three years straight. There's, there was a, a, an A-team camp, an advisor team camp in the northwest of i and it was called Camp Opie. And Len uh, just served continuously. He was single. Uh, he was just a warrior, and he got his DCM in Korea. Just to give you an idea of the man, he would take his patrols up to the wire. He only had young soldiers, so he would go through the wire with a garrote, and he would wait for Chinese to come out of their bunkers for a piddle or a smoke, and he'd garrote them. He would then remove an ear because that was proof that you'd done it and there was you got a bounty on that, right? So Leonard come back with a bag full of ears and, and so on. Now, I was told this story and I didn't believe it. And then I took over Len's desk when he, when Gough Whitlam created the great purge of 73 he kicked a lot of these guys out of the army, the people who weren't regular army. They were CMF full-time duty. And Len got the boot. I couldn't believe it. A man with so much experience. Anyway, I take over Len's desk. I open up the top drawer and there's all pens. And at the back of the desk of that drawer was a garrote. So I tended to believe the story from that moment. I mean, you know, not many people carry a garrote, you know, but... But Len did, and he was, when I spoke to senior officers who came to our camp who knew Len Opie from Korea and Vietnam, it, the praise was unlimited. You couldn't, it was bottomless. Um, those sort of guys, you know, were incredible. Um, and and when you read the citations of of the Victoria Cross winners in particular, it's, it's not about winning a battle. It's about saving their mates. And two of them paid the supreme sacrifice and while, whilst earning their Victoria Cross because they did not abandon their mates and they ended up dying alongside them when they got overrun. It's uh, pretty sobering stuff. They're extraordinary stories, and I encourage everyone to listen, listening to this to go and check out those um, Victoria Cross, well, all of Victoria Cross winners from Vietnam, but in particular those ones from the team. Quite remarkable. You mentioned um, Ray Simo Simpson, and there's a, a tie-in here with what we were saying about the long lineage of, of, of experience because I've just my book about the Cowra breakout has just come out, and you would think that that does not have much of a link at all to the training team in Vietnam several decades later except that Ray Simo Simpson, who went on to earn the Victoria Cross as part of the training team in Vietnam, was an 18-year-old recruit in Cowra at the time of the breakout. <laughs> and he actually was sent to the... He was in the army camp, not the prisoner of war camp. And after the Japanese broke out of the prisoner of war camp, he was sent as sort of this big armed patrol to come down and help shore up the camp. And as in his words, had a spell on number one machine gun outside the camp and saw the devastation firsthand of the Cowra breakout. So yeah. interesting to think that even during the Second World War, Simo Simpson was still doing his bit as an 18-year-old recruit yeah. and then obviously yeah. went on to big things in, uh, in in Korea and Vietnam. Just extraordinary, that link that comes through. Uh, mate, when we talk about this experience of serving, um, I want to touch a little bit on, on the book that you've just done with us um, after the blood cools, The Warrior's Dilemma, because 
um, even though your experience wasn't specifically with the training team, I think that it, that book talks about some universals that apply not even just to Vietnam, to, to being in combat in general. I mean, tell us a little bit about the book and, you know, and just the, the putting your experiences of combat down on, that, on those pages. Well, Matt, uh, you might remember when you asked me to, to do something back before COVID really took hold. Um, once it did take hold, I really was housebound and couldn't go out and do the research that I probably wanted to do for the for the book that I we were thinking of doing. So as president of my local sub-branch of the RSL, I was in touch with the guys who have a finger on the pulse of the returning Iraq and Afghanistan war veterans. And then the number of suicides started to be made apparent and I was totally appalled that so many young warriors were topping themselves because they couldn't get the support or the help that they needed. And uh, what I wanted to do was to shine a light into a very dark place. And that very dark place is where warriors are asked to go before they go to war, during the war, and then afterwards. And I'm talking about not just, I'm not just talking about shooting at people, I'm talking about combat and everything that it means. So I'm talking about all the stresses that impact on the individual, like fear, terror, shock, horror, and then finally grief, and how it actually impacts on you. And so I, I split the book up into two parts. The first part I called 10 Foot Tall and Bulletproof, which was about my experience of being conscripted and going to war and then being shot and the recovery. And then the second part, I've called, you know, you know, it was basically getting back on my feet again and and the road to recovery because um, I didn't get post-traumatic stress until 30 years after the event. So I wanted to use my own situation to show people that while some people might be seeming to function okay, they might be suffering underneath. And I think I was lucky being in the army for 30 years. I had a lot of people around me who supported me. But once I left that system, then then you realise just how alone you can be uh, if, you're not, if you're not given any support. Well, it's an extraordinary book, mate, and we were very proud that we uh, we put that out in conjunction with you. It's it's called After the Blood Cools, The Warrior's Dilemma, and I'll put a link to it in the show notes so that people can find that and order it on our website. But it, anyone who's interested in not just the experience of Vietnam veterans but combat veterans in general should absolutely, absolutely check that out. It's an extraordinary book. The reason the book came about, as you said, was because of COVID, and both of us were in the same predicament then that we couldn't get out and walk the ground. We, you know, you and I are both used to... I think I think that we I think it's safe to say that what we enjoy more than anything else is getting back there to the battlefields and walking the ground. I mean, the experience of you is obviously very different from my experience as a, as a veteran who fought on this ground. But um, COVID meant that we had a bit of time in our hands. But it's great to see now that we can get back over there, mate. And you are next year in 2023 leading a tour for us back to Vietnam. I'm super excited. I've I've had the privilege of walking the ground with you in Vietnam, and it's. It's absolutely extraordinary to be there with you and other veterans. The only battlefield tour we do where you get to experience it with veterans through the eyes of the people who are actually there. Um, tell us, mate, you must be pretty excited to be heading back over to Vietnam again. Yeah, it's funny. I was at a, at a lunch uh, last Thursday and uh, one of the guys that we'd signed up to go back and, of course, that tour was cancelled. And so, you know, Doug's been sitting on his deposit for a couple of years and every time I saw him he'd say when are we going back when are we going you know and uh so I had the the opportunity to tell him last Thursday mate we're going in March and he was so excited and uh I was telling my neighbors who were down for drinks last Friday um they come and invade my house on Fridays for some reason I don't know why but um 
no connection with the military whatsoever, except through other relatives. And I'm hoping that the, the four of them will come along on, on our next tour, and they're quite excited that we're going to be able to go back um, and and walk the ground again. I've I've been going through my uh, dress book trying to re-establish my links with the Vietnamese guys and people that we work with just to hope that they're, they're still around and we can tap into them, you know. It's been a tough time for everyone, you know, no more, oh. no much, no more so than the, the people over there who, you know, rely on tourists for their business. Uh, I was fortunate enough, the last time we were in Vietnam together was in 2016 um, and I was fortunate to be there with you then. And just to, if I may indulge in a brief anecdote, just to, to paint the picture for people, because I don't even think you realise, Gary, the significance of what this means to go back and walk the ground for people who weren't there. But I remember there was there was you and a half dozen other veterans and we were sitting around the pool um, at the lovely resort we were staying at after a day on the battlefields and everyone else had gone to bed and it was just the veterans and me and the veterans just started telling their stories. You know, they they knew that they were in safe company and that the, the only, really the only people who would understand were the other blokes sitting around those table, that table with a cold beer, and they just started to tell the stories. And it was one of the most amazing moments of my life because I realised that for whatever reason and probably completely undeservedly, they had accepted me as part of that group, even though I obviously didn't serve in Vietnam. And it was just remarkable. And I just... You know, as as someone who is so passionate about this, I just said to myself, I remember saying to myself, Matt, just shut up. Don't try to get involved in the conversation. Just soak in what's happening here. And it was just an extraordinary moment. And veteran, you know, these guys, and they'd become good mates during this tour with me. I'd really enjoyed getting to know them. And every now and again, one of them would get, the conversation probably went on for an hour or more, just telling the old stories. And every now and again, someone would get up and walk away from the table and just take a moment just to collect their thoughts and, you know take a deep breath and they'd come back and they'd sit down again. And just, I heard phrases like, oh, I've never told anyone this. Um, I never even told my wife this story. And just, you know, there are a few tears around the table, but it was just such an extraordinary thing. And it struck me as someone who's, you know, walked a lot of battlefields. It's it's a unique thing about that Vietnam experience that it still is, you know, still is living history for so many of these people. And I mean, that surely must be the the most special part of going back is is taking those veterans back and helping them, you know, it's a cliche to say, you know, closure and all these words, but there is a real sense of them going through a journey when they go back to Vietnam. That must be an extraordinary thing for you to uh, to, to share in that with them. Yeah, and, you know, of, Matt, of all the hundreds of veterans that, are, that have accompanied me in the last 25 years, um, not one of them has regretted going back. and uh, And it's really great when they go back with either their partners and or their kids. And it even happened to me when I took my daughter back when she was 21. She's now 40. Um, but I interviewed her for a book I did called Going Back. And uh, and she wrote a piece for the publisher. I didn't get to see it. Um, but the editor then sent me what my daughter Kelly had written and she wrote something to the effect of, uh, I think I now understand why my dad is the man who he is. And, you know, and you don't think of it yourself. You know, you just think you're, you know, just a handsome, good-looking chap. But um, it's it must be the things you do and the things you say and the way you react to all manner of things in life. And... I had, I've always had a lot of wives. When we say goodbye at the airport, when we're when we're leaving, and the and the two tour is breaking up, a lot of wives have said to me, "Thank you so much for helping me understand what X has been through." And uh, yeah, and that, it, it's a nice feeling, really is. Well, that was a key component of our of what we wanted to do. You know, maybe fifteen years ago when we first started talking about doing tours together to Vietnam and we I remember we discussed should they just be for veterans and and you were quite adamant that no the families need to come as well not just the families anyone that wants to um is welcome to come along because that's part of the collective experience and and what a rare privilege for those of us 
who have never served and who've never fought in a war to to share that experience. But it is the remarkable thing about those Vietnam tours, that connection. You know, we I met, um, well, hello to Virginia Glide if she's listening, um, you know, the families who had their, you know, her father had passed away. He was a Vietnam veteran. He'd since passed away. And so she was now going back with her mum to try and understand a little bit about, yeah. you know, his life and his experience after he'd gone. Yeah. And it's just, it's, it's wonderful work with a much higher purpose than simply tourism or simply even yeah. learning about history. It's a really remarkable um, aspect that only comes with the Vietnam tours. Yeah. It was interesting on the, on the last tour before COVID shut us down, I had uh, two commandos who'd just come back from Iraq and uh, at our welcome dinner, uh, which is in the former residence of Henry Cabot Lodge in Saigon, and I asked everybody, oh, why have you come on the tour? And a lot of people said, well, you know, we, we knew you were leading the tour, Gary, and you've been here and done that and all that. <laughs> but the, these two bloody commandos said, oh, yeah, we, uh, we wanted to see what the difference was and we wanted to come on this tour before you die. <laughs> and I said, thanks very much. <laughs> uh, you know, someone but, once said to me that I should be an exhibit at the Australian War Memorial, you know. But, uh, isn't that, I think, that, I thought that was in your will, mate. Aren't they going to stuff you <laughs> and just and stand you up like an animatronic in the War Memorial? And as you walk past, you can raise a stiff arm and tell people what it was like to be yeah, in the war. But it was funny. They both got so much out of the two of those guys because all their engagements in Iraq were at distances of in excess of two or 300 metres. And here we are at Coochie, and you might remember when we stuck you down a tunnel there at one stage. Yeah, stuck is the key word. I think yeah. I got stuck in the tunnel. I was slightly larger <laughs> yeah. than I am now. <laughs> that they were realising our, our engagement distances were Less than half a cricket pitch, you know. So they learnt a lot about what we had to go through. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's so a rare it's privilege to walk that ground, and I'm sure it's uh, you've got many tours left in you, Gary. Um, but mate, thank you so much for joining us today. We've got a few things for people to take away. Definitely go and learn more about the Australian Army Training Team, Vietnam. Uh, in especially you know this month is the 60th anniversary of their first deployment. Check out Gary's book on the subject, uh, Men Who Men Who Persevered. Um, check out Gary's latest book, which he's done in conjunction with us at Living History, which is called After the Blood Cools. And absolutely, I would say, if you have any interest in Vietnam and just learning about this experience firsthand, join Gary on a tour. Uh, you absolutely won't regret it. So I'll put links to all these things in the show notes. The tour is in March next year, uh, March 2023. Um, absolutely get on it if you want to uh, walk the ground with Gary. You, uh, you won't regret it. It's a, it's a rare privilege. Gary, it's always a pleasure to catch up, mate. We're well overdue for a beer, so we'll have to do that in person sometime soon. But uh, okay. as always, it's been great to have you on the podcast. So thanks for joining us. My pleasure.